Et I think uh, there are a few seats, uh, so you could come uh, maybe closer. If not, if you're too shy, or thank you, David. <laughs> thank you for sacrificing yourself. So the goal of today is indeed to highlight some of the impacts, also potential that AI is bringing to Europe. And I think through the different testers and uh, these also testing experience and demonstrators, you've been able to see different applications for different domains. And I think the goal for today is to maybe also sensitize you on how AI in Europe can impact different domains from education to governance to arts and also to research. So I will invite all the speakers to come uh, also. First, Mark Schonauer. So he's a research director at INRIA. INRIA is specialized in hard sciences in uh, Europe, in France. He joined in 2001 after 20 years with another research center in France. He founded Tao team at INRIA, and his work is also specifically at the intersection of evolutionary computation, machine learning, and he's the author of more than 150 papers, co-advisor of also more than 35 PhD students. That's a hell of a task, so congratulations. I'm now also calling Athena, so if you can come, Athena is currently a PhD candidate with the Artificial Intelligence Research Institute in Barcelona. She's working on developing AI tools. You might have also seen her during the demonstration. And really her goal is to try to solve, team f uh, to solve the team formation problems under the supervision of Professor Carles Serra and uh, Juan Rodriguez Aguilar. Her PhD studies are funded by the consultation company Enzyme Advising Group. And now I have the pleasure of inviting Evangelia. So Evangelia is working at DigiConnect, and uh, she's the head of sector on artificial intelligence, technology, deployment, and impact at the European Commission, and has been a program and policy officer at DigiConnect for a few years. And now, Dewi. Dewi Brumet is uh, passionate about origami for 10 years. He's an artist, and recently has also been more passionate about the textile pleading. He has been developing strong skills and knowledge for folding and has been collaborating recently with researchers to develop soft robots. So we have a very interesting panel today to maybe also present some of uh, the diversity that we have in Europe when it comes to AI. So I have a very broad question to start with. It's maybe let's start with you, Mark, is what brought you to AI? And in a few sentences, explain us how you came to this field. Yes, hello. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, <coughs> yes, so okay. When I when I uh, when I graduated so many years ago, there were not even uh, courses in computer science. So I was an applied mathematician uh, and then started to use computer science and gradually uh, starting to use computers to do, as Olga pointed out, uh, to compute uh, things in applied math and uh, numerical simulations. Uh, and gradually I came to <coughs> think and work about uh, meshes. So maybe you've heard about meshes with uh, the first uh, demo over there. Uh, you want to, to define, uh, to, to, to partition the space into small elements so you can make uh, computations there. And it's, uh, it's an art, designing meshes is an art. And I was trying to, well, not only me, but to, to come up with the rules to, de to define a good mesh because you have good meshes and bad meshes that give lousy results. And at that time was also the time of expert systems. You might have heard about expert systems. And so it was a natural uh, move to move to expert systems. But at the same time, uh, when trying to, when you, when you know how to simulate and to predict uh, what's going to happen, you also want to optimize. That is, you want to tune uh, the parameters of your, your part or your, your system to reach a certain goal. And this, uh, sometimes called an inverse problem, and this sometimes, and uh, very often in mathematics, this is ill-posed. And to solve ill-posed problem, well, the, the standard mathemat uh, mathematician uh, algorithm didn't work, and I turned to another uh, side of uh, what is now AI, which is optimization, uh, and in particular stochastic optimization and evolutionary computation. And then, uh, gradually, this uh, led me um, further away from uh, math and uh, closer to AI. Uh, I just want to, to recall that at that time, AI was uh, 
at least in France, uh, this uh, Cartesian country who is full of uh, great mathematicians, was quite a rude world. You should not say you were doing AI. So, uh, but this has changed, of course. Now it's uh, very nice and uh, to be recognized uh, as an AI researcher. So this is basically how I uh, thank you. To AI. Now, Evangelia, also maybe you could explain also the key role that you have even for an event like today, uh, coordinating efforts in terms of artificial intelligence. You should have a microphone close to you. So how did you come to working on AI? Okay, so, uh, so actually when I finished school, I, I knew that I wanted to do something with psychology, but I also wanted to do something with technology. And uh, in Stuttgart, where I was uh, living, they had this kind of new uh, degree. It was called computational linguistics, so natural language processing. So actually was dealing with artificial intelligence without it being necessarily tech uh, artificial intelligence. There was machine translation, we worked with neural networks. And then this is how I actually came also to work at the European Commission because the unit back then was uh, dealing with the linguistic interfaces, technologies. Now, coincidentally, I worked then other in other units as well, but I ended up in the same unit that in the meantime was dealing with robotics and artificial intelligence. So in a way it was always following uh, me wherever I was going. So it was not necessarily a kind of a decision, but it kind of happened naturally, I would say. All right, thank you. And you will have a chance to also explain what you do and your impact. So Athena, so how did you come to work on artificial intelligence? Uh, well, I was uh, studying uh, computer engineering and at some point uh, I find it very fascinating the fact that we can use uh, something that is very abstract like math to do something very concrete which is uh, to uh, automate things and uh, that make their own decisions and all the uh, story of uh, artificial intelligence that we can have um, uh, help from a machine just to, to do uh, complex things that we uh, should spend uh, hours and hours by doing it manually. So I um, got uh, this idea uh, very, it, it was very fun for me. Okay. And, uh, I was very uh, impressed at the time. <laughs> so I hope you still are. <laughs> okay. uh, Dewi, maybe also for you, you are, have an interesting profile. So please explain to us also how you came to work on the robots. So yeah, I'm an artist more on manual things. So normally I don't need, need technology, but uh, I, I got into this more uh, with Fab Labs, uh, mainly with the Open Fab uh, in Brussels. And so more with uh, values of uh, sharing uh, uh, new ways of, of doing things and, and finding new ways of uh, doing my art and creativity. And also on the research level, collaborating with uh, Inria uh, Defrost Lab in Lille also. All right, thank you. So as we will talk about AI and society, I also want to say to the audience that if you have questions, uh, we will have a moment at the end, but also if you have a burning question, it is okay. You can also raise your hand, uh, and if I'm turned this way, you can uh, call me. So maybe with you, Evangelia, can you explain a little bit uh, what your role in regards to AI and maybe the role of your office in regards to AI can be for society and maybe the mission that you have and how you think the two collide? So basically, when it comes to artificial intelligence, we are uh, two units in, in, in the DG, in DG Connect, the European Commission. And what we're basically trying to do is to implement the European approach of AI, so the, the ecosystem of trust, so trustworthy AI, but also the ecosystem of excellence when it comes to research excellence. And we believe that, I mean, this European approach, as you all probably all know, we also, the European Commission published last year a draft AI regulation that's supposed to also create the digital single market for AI in Europe and allow also innovators and industry kind of to know and know within which framework they can actually develop and while also stimulating innovation. So so our role in my unit is really to, to, to uh, fund also projects that are in line with this European approach in trustworthy AI, so AI that is fair, transparent, explainable, unbiased, etc., etc. So this is the work that we are doing. And at the same time, we're also busy in uh, the European Commission within with one on the one hand side research project, but also on the other hand uh, with the deployment, there is a digital Europe program. We will set up also now dis uh, testing and experimentation facilities because a lot of things is happening in a, in, in a f uh, 
and the lab, but we also want to bring from the lab to the market the AI technology, so we have to test it in real world environments and make sure also that it's kind of robust. So this is, I think, the role that we're doing. The regulation, as I said, to put the framework within which, uh, uh, while respecting the, the, the fundamental values of the EU, uh, also allow for innovation when it comes to AI. And could you explain for those of you maybe who don't know what DigiConnect is, what is exactly DigiConnect? Well, I think, as the word says, it's connecting, but connecting with technologies. So uh, the, the DG uh, deals with a, a variety of technologies, mostly digital uh, technologies. So you could say it's the digital uh, director general within the European Commission. Okay. Thank you very much. And as you said, it's also about connecting with research. And we know that these technologies are fueled by research and a lot of investments in research. And maybe, Mark, you could tell us a little bit about uh, what you have observed in the past years in terms of AI research, what are maybe the big changes and where it's maybe headed, if you have a few sentences or words of wisdom on that? Big question. Uh, <coughs> yes. Uh, well, f first of all, I'd like to say that I'm very uncomfortable with giving a definition of AI. I mean, uh, there, are, there have been a, a lot of uh, tentative definitions, uh, like mimicking the human brain, the human reasoning, or the functioning of the human brain. Uh, my favorite definition, and, uh, and I want to give it here because uh, it impacts uh, the rest of what I'm going to say, uh, is attributed to Jean-Louis Laurier in the 80s, a French pioneer of AI. Uh, and uh, it says that uh, AI is succeeding in, in uh, making the computer does doing something it has never been done by a computer before. So that's, that's great, that may it covers many things. Uh, then of course when a pocket calculator was invented, it was AI, but now it's just a routine, uh, routine tool and this is true for many things. Today, uh, if, if you want to, to look at the, <coughs> the let's say, uh, recent successes in computer vision, for instance, uh, face recognition, object recognition, and so forth, which is one of the, the recent uh, highlights. Uh, but today you can find off-the-shelf uh, programs that do this, so it's, is it still AI, or is it just programming, computing? Uh, well, the question at least uh, needs, to be, uh, needs to be asked. Uh, and basically that's also what uh, Holger described as be AI being a very complex uh, way of programming. And, but sometimes in complex systems, uh, it's becoming so complex, uh, it gives outcomes that were not expected. That's one of the definitions of complex systems. And so it, it can happen that, yes, AI gives a sense of, uh, of uh, human intelligence. Uh, but, okay, uh, to me, just a very uh, a way of programming, a new way of programming, uh, with new tools that has been uh, as it has been evolving in the, in, in the past. So, uh, what are the main trends? Well, uh, here again, we should we should um, go back to to history. Maybe uh, AI, as as many things in computer science, you can attribute uh, some uh, roots to Alan Turing. Uh, can machine think? I mean, he wrote a, a book about can machine think, and in this book, he already said that. If you want to program something that's very complex, like the human brain, back on the envelope computation gives that you would need, uh, I don't know, thousands of years uh, just to write this. So the only way is to teach the machine, to teach the computer. And so you al already uh, advocate something which is known as uh, well, reinforcement learning or, or machine learning in general. Uh, at the same time, or a little bit later, the first time uh, the word artificial intelligence was used is the famous Dartmouth workshop in '56. So it's not uh, recent, as you can see. Uh, uh, but these these guys, the most famous computer scientists at the at the time, uh, hypothesis that you can reproduce the functioning of the brain with logical operations. And so they are, and the goal was to mimic the brain with some logical operation. If it's only logical operations, then a computer should be able to do the same. Uh, and uh, the, the, this, uh, this tendency was, uh, so let's say, uh, dominant for some time. So, okay, I will uh, make a long story short. There are many uh, what's called AI winters, because AI promised a lot and delivered uh, little. Uh, 
uh, and then some new techniques ap appeared, like expert system. They promised a lot, and they delivered a little. Uh, so you can uh, continue this uh, 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 this story for some time. Uh, so that was was called uh, symbolic AI. At the same time, you had what was called, uh, let's say, subsymbolic or numeric AI, uh, and that's what the recent. Uh, it's a revival of AI uh, in the 2010s, uh, which was, as I said, computer science and uh, uh, sorry, uh, computer vision and uh, deep learning revolution, and that's uh, where we are today. But if I can continue, I think the the, the, the future of AI lies in in some uh, in between in between this uh, symbolic and and, uh, and deep learning in between uh, by hybridization. Uh, I can develop later if you, know, okay. if you want. Thank you. And I think uh, you've mentioned a few important ideas. The first one also being that it has systems can learn as well. And I think as a whole, the field can also learn from other disciplines. And I think also that's where Dewey, you can bring something very interesting. And in. you are working with roboticists who also use uh, AI softwares. But maybe you can explain how you've seen the collaboration between artists and scientists, computer scientists, and how that works, and how do you think that can be promising? Yeah, so I've been working the past six months with uh, with this uh, lab, uh, Defrost of Inria, and I think it's really interesting because uh, I sometimes feel that uh, artists and scientists have, have uh, is the face of the the, the same coin, um, and sometimes we have the same goal, but we take different paths and sometimes contrarize, uh, etc. And uh, I think it's interesting to be part of this project because uh, sometimes scientists or researchers, because they need to, they need funding, they need to publicize or, or whatsoever. They have uh, um, um, uh, um, things that uh, um, they they tend to avoid things that I would, uh, as an artist, uh, uh, feel as important. Uh, if a robot fails, for example, in the fields of prototyping, if they glitch or something, uh, for me it's really interesting. Sometimes I bring it, they take it as an error, I take it as something positive, I transform it, and then sometimes it can get back into the research because I modify it and I, 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 I add some new, new things to it. Um, and I think as an artist also I bring um, um, I mean, competencies that sometimes research uh, would not have uh, as to sharing, for example, and, and, and transmitting uh, uh, research in other ways than, than publication. I mean, my work is a lot about visual things, so I, I, I would say that I know how to, to make it, uh, 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 how to share it, I would say. Um, and of course, they help me in fields that I would not have the competency in it, uh, in, in technical fields, but also I think in, in ways they, they are, are making robots. When they are making robots, they are also making and creating new aesthetism, um, uh, new fields of sensitivity. Maybe they don't, they don't think about it, but, but they're making it. And that's also really in interesting for me. Thank you very much. And uh, you, I think, talking about arts, the first word that comes to mind very logically is creativity. And I think something, Athena, that you touched upon also in your demonstration is how AI in education could also take a, a lot of different factors, elements that are quite complex to assess even as humans. And so I was curious to hear maybe your thoughts on how AI and education can collide and education being such a sensitive topic. I was really curious to hear your thoughts. Uh, well, um, I think that um, uh, in education we have a lot of uh, space to explore because um, we have to uh, work with uh, mostly young people that they do not know a lot of uh, about themselves. So we have to uh, help them uh, to use AI in order to learn more. And uh, what we are doing is uh, we uh, take uh, and combine different things from different uh, sciences like uh, social sciences or uh, psycholog psychological uh, sciences and we say okay uh, these uh, tools are working uh, for people we can uh, employ these findings in uh, young people and we can use AI that combines these uh, tools in the best way in the, uh, in order to find the best uh, uh, well, we are doing the information, so we are trying to find the best themes for the students, so uh, 
the students can learn more through uh, engaging with other students. So I think that uh, in our case is that uh, we take things, combine them, and uh, feed them to AI to uh, help uh, students. So for me, AI is uh, basically a means to help uh, people. All right, thank you. And uh, I want to take just a small break to thank also the speakers for having come from far, from Luxembourg, from Spain, uh, also from France and from Lille, uh, not so far, but still, thank you very much. And Olga as well for having come uh, and uh, yeah, in the context of strikes everywhere. So thank you again. Um, so now I also want to maybe go back to the idea that the three of you specifically have also contributed and or contribute actively to what is AI in Europe through your research projects or through maybe more the overall governance and, uh, and support for this. So could you maybe, Evangelia, tell us, w is there such a thing as a European vision of AI? Because we see indeed, and having worked in North America as other people in this room, we do see that there is a difference, but could you put words maybe on it and what you think there is? I think the difference is, as I said, this European approach on AI and, and trustworthy AI and, and establishing kind of, a, a, as I said, what is being tagged as the digital single market for AI. I mean, to allow, you know, that this, uh, and as, as I don't know how many of you know, this uh, proposal for a draft AI regulation has a risk-based approach. So, I mean, it will only regulate really something that is would consider high risk, but the majority of the applications I mean, there is no hindrance there, so they they can be kind of brought to the market very easily. And what w what we would like to allow is that to establish the kind of framework where this can happen very quickly. But as I said, the approach, the European approach, I would really say is really uh, based also on the work of the high-level expert group that worked on this kind of recommendations and the guidelines into trustworthy AI. So the AI that we like to see in Europe is the one that respects the, the fundamental values that we, we praise and uh, respect here in Europe. And I think like with GDPR, I mean, this is something, a model that we could also export, I mean, outside of Europe, this kind of trustworthiness because what is really essential in the end of the day that it's not just the technology that's being developed in the lab but it's that it's actually being taken up by the citizens as well and they need to be able to trust so I mean the the, the, the system has to be transparent explainable and I mean robust in itself so I mean th in order to have this uptake that we expect also to happen in Europe th some things have to happen and I think this is the framework that we'd like to establish here in Europe all right, thank you. And also from a research perspective, and I will look at you, Athena and Mark, but let's start with you, maybe Mark. Do you think that there is such a thing as a, a European vision also on research or a European perspective on research that is maybe taking into account all the things that were said by Evangelia, the trustworthiness included? Uh, well, I, I can only uh <laughs> support what, uh, what uh, Evangelia said. Uh, this is also true at the level of the researchers. There is really a, a concern for trustworthiness, for transparency, uh, and there's a need for regulation, that's for sure, and maybe I can comment uh, more on this, but there's a need for research, because, uh, for instance, uh, uh, what is what is uh, a, a trustworthy uh, system? There is no measure of trustworthiness per se, so there is a need for research there. What is explainability? Uh, of course, you, you everybody imagine what explainability is, but uh, when it comes to actually measure it, uh, it depends to whom you're talking, it depends uh, of the context and, and everything, so uh, there's a, a, a need for research. And uh, as I already said, said uh, probably much of the research that's needed after the revolution that I mentioned about uh, deep learning is to hybridize with maybe more symbolic, like uh, reasoning. You need to reason to reason to be able to, to bound uh, the system that you, you have learned from data, because uh, everybody knows, I guess, in the room, the ro ro robotic laws of Asimov, the three laws of Asimov, that uh, you should not harm a human and so on and so forth. But today, it's absolutely impossible to implement these laws in, in uh, robotic brains, if there is any around. Uh, and, and you need to work wi with reasoning, with formal methods, and, and there's a lot of research that's, that's needed, and, and yes. Uh, now, maybe to come back to the question, <laughs> uh, yes, I, I, I have the feeling that uh, in Europe this is now, really uh, everybody has, has really realized this, 
many colleagues from the US, uh, we don't work so much with Chinese uh, colleagues, but many colleagues from the US have also realized that. It's even more true in Canada or in Japan. Uh, but in, in, in Europe, there is this uh, whole atmosphere uh, around trustworthiness that, that's pregnant, yes. Okay. Thank you. And uh, Athena, I think you also, uh, because of the nature of also who is financially supporting your research, showing that now there is public research, also private support. Pri and so could you maybe give us and to the audience an example of how can also private companies embody this form of trustworthiness in ed uh, pro your project, for instance, on education? Uh, um, actually, uh, in my case, uh, the company was very interesting on the concept of of uh, team formation, uh, not only on uh, education that we have been researching, but uh, expanding it into internal use uh, inside uh, their own company or uh, other companies. And in this process, they were very interested on uh, explainability as well. So they wanted uh, a way to um, uh, to justify why the uh, algorithm gave us this. Um, uh, uh, this uh, recommendation. So uh, there can be a, a push from the industry towards the research, the research on a specific uh, way because they, they need to justify that. Uh, and uh, that was, uh, in my case, the, the reason. Uh, they uh, wanted something. Uh, they were uh, requested. It was very interesting for us as well as researchers because it is very... Um, uh, it is very ne it is necessary for uh, a researcher to make their um, algorithms to be trusted by the users. So we uh, had this uh, very nice uh, uh, way of, of going. All right. Thank you for explaining a bit the process. And I think uh, I will start also with myself. We have blind spots in AI research. And one of them is uh, for our institute, for instance, here, Fari in, uh, in Brussels. Uh, we sometimes look at the technical aspect, the societal aspect, the, all the applications. And there are some fields that we sometimes don't really look at as much as we should. And art, I think, is definitely one field where there should be more, I think, uh, inspiration drawn from arts and also more collaboration. So we do see here and there things. But your projects showed that it's possible to use also art as an inspiration. Um, do you feel like there, I, there are not enough artists working with the scientists? And do you think even for your colleagues or acquaintances, it's something that your experience maybe inspired them? Yeah, yeah of course. Uh, I think art and science uh, field is quite a niche. Uh, and there's, of course, plenty of things to do and, and collaboration. And I'm not directly working on uh, AI, but on technology, I feel that uh, as an artist, there's um, quite things that are really interesting, not in terms of uh, um, not only, of course, innovation that can come to, to this process of, of interaction, but also fields of, uh, of uh, questioning. And I think AI is also not only about finding new innovation, but it's also, as an artist, really interesting on, on how, um, how deep it can get on, 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 on new ways of uh, uh, seeing what is intelligence, what is consciousness, what is a robot, what is human, etc. And as an artist, this is the question that I would I would really tackle when when I would be in collaboration with scientists. Okay, thank you. And I think you touched upon the idea that sometimes there are things that are not present in the conversation about AI. And for me, I think it's a, an interesting question that I wanted to also ask you: is what do you think is missing in today's conversation about AI specifically in its role to society. So I will start with you. Sorry for that. And so if what you have maybe some thoughts, because you have a very unique position for the governance, you have this bird-eyed view on the whole field in Europe, and you think there's something that is still missing. Hmm. I think <laughs> <laughs> a little bit what my colleague here said. I think what, what is important is this diversity aspect. I don't see it a lot yet happening. I hope to see more of that because I think once we bring everybody together on the table and discuss and design, for example, AI systems or whatever, we will really truly innovate. I mean, w we, we have uh, things like science and technology and arts also funded by the European Commission, and people also not just talk about STEM skills, but STEAM skills with the arts involved. I think what is still missing for me, at least from what I've seen and so far is this discourse with the citizens, so with the, the end users of that, which I don't see a lot. So we design systems, but not really with them 
in the design process involved. So I think what we truly have to kind of work towards to is, if, because sometimes people will tell me, usually the answer I get is, that's difficult to do and bring them in and everything. I, I do not accept normally that's difficult. I think I tr I'd like to see that where people really try to do it. So it's not just interdisciplinarity, but it's also intersectoriality. So, and also bringing the end, the end users, the citizens in the design process, in research projects. This is what I would like to see more. No, that's, that's a very good point. It's uh, something that we see a lot more in research, everybody talking about how citizens should be co-designers of the systems, or, but also uh, consulted from the start and not only at the finish when things are done and it's like, okay, what do you think of it? And it's a comment that I hear more and more and maybe, Mark, also, could you give us some insight? Have you ever seen or participated to projects where citizens were involved or w how do you th see that happening? What would be your recommendations on yes, that? Yes, I mean, I, I will come back to my favorite word when talking about AI these days. It's hybridization. Yes, we need to do hybridization, not only between uh, symbolic, some symbolic, not only between AI and, and formal methods or, or the like, or applied math or whatever, but also with human and social sciences, uh, like sociology, and this uh, would in, in, in indeed bring the, the, the citizen there uh, with art, with... Uh, <coughs> Sorry. Um, yes, all, all the history and the like. Uh, and here I may uh, divert a little bit from the question because uh, I think this kind of hybridization all around uh, is maybe the only uh, advantage that uh, remains to the public research, academic research, compared to the big tech research because big tech have a high um, let's say more uh, financial uh, <laughs> budget and then can uh, really uh, attract the researchers, but they don't have this diversity uh, that you can find in, in universities, in, in, uh, in a big uh, research institutes. And so this is something we should uh, not only uh, push, but also cultivate and, and try to, to keep. Okay, thank you. And Athena, do you think there is something missing also in the AI conversation today? Is there something that from your perspective and experience, you think we should talk more about or hear more about? Um, well, I will uh, agree with that uh, we will need more uh, people, citizens, to uh, be engaged in this. So uh, we we want to uh, the, the citizens to not expect something magical from AI, but uh, to be educated with uh, what AI is and uh, to know what to expect and in be involved in this. Not just um, uh, see a black box and uh, 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 expect something magical coming out of it, but to understand and uh, help the researchers on uh, developing more uh, uh, smart uh, intelligent systems. Thank you. And uh, it's a perfect segue for the next question I had about also education. We see working daily for instance, for us in Brussels with uh, different entities, that sometimes there are misconceptions about the technology or the set of technologies that we have to re-explain every time what it, what it is, and it's not a magic wand that will solve all problems. So I think it's a common frustration that we all uh, might sometimes have. It's setting the expectations right. And education is key, starting with children, and I think a center like you are, the one you're into today, contributes to that, to a better understanding of what is behind the system that I interact with on a daily basis. And something you said, Dewey, is also that art could be useful for researchers to do something more than just publishing, to educate. And could you maybe extend a little bit on this idea of how art can be a key element of AI education? Um, I mean, I, I think not only art, but it's a, it's a matter of, uh, yeah, get it to the citizen and, and I think it's a matter of pedagogy and, and adapting the pedagogy or, or the, the, the vocabulary or, or to, to your public. And I think uh, once you get into one public, you cannot just uh, copy paste to another public. You need to adapt the, the, the things, how, how you say it, etc. So I think there's a new way of documenting maybe that we need to invent and adapt to the different public that we have. And, and there's still many things to do in, in this. Okay, thank you. And Evangelia, do you, can you give us some insights maybe on what is Europe's vision on how to educate on AI? What are the key priorities uh, in your view? I think 
awareness raising is important, but I think the one thing that I hear from all sides whenever we talk about this is really skills. So I mean, the skills development from from uh, at school, so education settings, but also upskilling, reskilling, and actually for 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 also for the citizens to understand, I mean, I don't know now who said it from my colleagues, to understand what's capable, what are the limitations, because I think sometimes the public thinks that AI is capable, like what is understood uh, as uh, artificial general intelligence, but we are very far away from that. So I think once people understand what are the limitations, but also once people understand that it's not there to take away jobs, it's actually there to take away dull, repetitive, you know, dirty or dangerous jobs, then I think maybe we will have a better discourse also with the public, because I see the, the, the actual kind of potential now in what is also called in collaborative intelligence, in bringing the best of the two worlds, of the n n human intelligence and artificial intelligence, but I see the skills aspect, and it's being repeated, whether you talk about, I mean, uh, I don't know, uh, b b b big data, uh, high performance computing, quantum, in all of these areas, the skills is a, a, pr a problem. It's not just AI. I mean, it's AI and then probably applied to a specific field. But I mean, skills development should really, really start very early onwards. So not in university, mm -hmm. really at school, and if possible at primary school. And that, that leads to for me, for uh, Mark, you have also been involved as a researcher. Uh, in the French AI strategy. And so maybe you also had some ideas on how to, as Evangelia said, improve the skills uh, at the national level, which is a big task. Yes, I mean, okay. Uh, anyway, in France we have a crisis of education at large, not only uh, education <laughs> about AI skills. Uh, but maybe I will uh, build on what Evangelia said. Uh, yes, we need to, to, to upskill people, well, and starting from, from school, of course, uh, starting from school. Uh, and this is important uh, to, to avoid these misunderstandings or the, the fantasies that <coughs> AI is, is raising. So uh, it was mentioned uh, artificial general intelligence, and uh, uh, peop some people and many people uh, simply are, are scared that the machines will take over the, the rule over the world. I mean, this is pure fantasy. Uh, it doesn't mean, so um, I will have two, two, uh, two answers to this. So the first one is yes, maybe it's, it's good that some people do research on this because on the way they will find something, even if I don't believe it will, uh, uh, it will come to anything close to uh, all the world. But on the other hand, uh, only by upskilling up uh, can we avoid that this fantasy is in fact uh, have a very bad role and, and, and people people get uh, get lost and so it might result first in rejecting completely uh, AI which would be uh, really a pity because AI can do really a lot of good to to, to mankind to humanity uh, but also it can help uh, let's say uh, uh, ill-directed people to to take over not not the machine but uh, some <laughs> other people like uh, uh, government using AI in the in the wrong way or, or big tech companies that uh, cannot be mastered anymore by the governments and uh, all these dangers are, are there because <coughs> mainly because people are not aware and are not skilled enough about what AI can do and cannot do. Okay, and so educating on also the technical realities behind AI is key. And one aspect that I also hear a lot, and we work on a project, for instance, here on creating a, a Belgian uh, open access content on education for educators uh, in schools. And something we hear and we heard and we decided to do was to also integrate uh, ethical education, education about AI ethics. And so I was uh, curious, Athena, maybe as you're also finishing your PhD research, uh, is it something that you've been exposed to already, AI ethics uh, courses? Do you think that you see already a change or a trend in this direction? Uh, actually, uh, last week I was uh, attending a summer school and uh, there was a lot about uh, the ethics on AI and uh, how um, Europe is trying to uh, be the moral, uh, more moral on AI. So I think it is very important because we, uh, we, set, we set the boundaries on what uh, smart uh, uh, systems can do, and uh, after that we can uh, discard all these um, dystopic uh, images we have from movies about uh, a AI taking over. So by do doing this uh, ethical um, 
perspective and uh, learning our uh, systems to be to follow some moral values, some ethical values that we found uh, ethical. Of course, it's not the same for everyone, but uh, for uh, some people's are uh, moral values. Uh, we can uh, set these uh, uh, boundaries and have a let's say a controlled uh, AI that will uh, help people not. Uh, do something that uh, we don't want to. <laughs> All right, thank you. And um, when it comes also to talking about AI and education, I think uh, a key element is that when new generations uh, learn about AI, uh, we see now, at least for instance in Belgium, that uh, universities uh, are, of course, the natural gateway to learning all about AI and ethics. But we also see just in the building we are located in, for instance, in the center of Brussels, a lot of other organizations that teach about uh, AI coding, programming, telling you that you can also become an AI active part of, I mean, that someone actively part of the AI scene, uh, employable immediately. And um, are there sort of guidelines, maybe Evangelia, on, you know, uh, Sh all these organizations that also arise to teach all these new skills uh, and all of that, would you favor maybe more uh, education in universities or is there something that Europe is also doing for all these other organizations that contribute to more education about AI? I think, I mean, being interested in that, I mean, you have to see also to be motivated. So the question is, for example, also when you go into schools, how do you motivate kids, you know, to pick up, let's say, coding or everything else? So, I mean, there are, I mean, what I would like ideally to say is that we take the lessons learned from other areas where they already tried to use and, and do the skills development and learn from that. And then I think if it's with a purpose, I think you get people motivated and engaged in that. So if we really want to get kids uh, uh, or get their attention, their curiosity, we have to really motivate them into going into a direction. But I think we have to kind of establish the means where, the, where we can um, nurture this kind of uh, curiosity and then make things happen. And I think that I'd like to see more happening now because I think sometimes you get the feeling that history repeats itself and uh, the same uh, uh, errors are being made. So hopefully once we learn from other kind of experiences that we can really adapt them and really get things going on from there. Could you name one of the errors that you think is reoccurring? I think when, I mean, I did also, I tried with my kids going to these coding classes for them to get them, you know, engaged into STEM and everything, but the, the ultimate goal was missing. Why should I learn this? So, I mean, why, what can I do with it? What can I, so th you have to show, show the examples and then kind of get their curiosity going on and then actually the motivation to be on board. So the why is sometimes missing. Why should I learn this? And this, I think, people can help with that, you know, when you design such courses that you give them the ultimate kind of goal and uh, motive to do that. Do you have any s thoughts on that maybe, Mark? Yes, yeah, so you mentioned so many, uh, so many places where you can learn kind of AI. And I think there's a danger there because uh, there's no control on this. I mean, they, they, they have no, nobody has control the, the level of what they're teaching. There's no, recognized diploma so there's a need for regulation also there and but this is also because there's not enough uh, staff in education I mean in ac academia or whatever because there was a sudden uh, demand uh, for such uh, for such education and then academia was not able to, to to provide what's needed so the solution then for you is reinforcing the higher education system and providing more supports and not only higher but uh, even a bit lower than I <laughs> <laughs> Yes. All right. So I will look at my colleagues and check how much time do I have. All right, it's done. Uh, I want to really thank uh, all the team that was behind this event. Anna, Eva, Holger, Marianne, Joost. So a big thank you to all of them and also to all the people behind the vision, uh, Claire, Elise, you meant AINet, Taylor, AI for Media, and so forth. So thank you very much for attending, and it was a pleasure talking with you, and thank you for coming for a lot of you, maybe from afar. So, yes. Yes, okay, we have time for then maybe questions. Please, David. Okay. Hello, hello, yes. Uh, thank you very much for the, all the 
very nice talk that you have. Um, so you mentioned something that I, I think it's uh, quite important is uh, what what kind of discussion we're getting, I mean, we're having with the non-specialized public actually about AI. Uh, something that actually found quite, quite interesting is that in many of the videos uh, there was shown like uh, blue holograms. Now I have never seen a blue hologram generated by AI. I don't know why it's an image that is such recurrent, but it never happens. And I think these kind of concepts of ideas are misleading what we can get or what we can do with the uh, AI today or what we want to do. Um, uh, what I wanted to precisely ask you, because maybe you, you have directed many projects on AI and you have some knowledge in the governance, is how much actually resources are devoted to, to have this discussion with the general public? Because yes, it is nice, we, we want to have this discussion, but how much of a project is devoted to public outreach? Or how much of the life of a PhD is devoted to, to teach the PhD how to reach actually the general public? So my, my belief is that if we want to actually reach the people, we need to teach the people that is developing the technology how to engage with them, as you say. So we need to find this motivation. It's difficult to create the motivation, but it's even more difficult if we do not teach the people that are doing the things how to develop these uh, skills. So if you can comment on this, I would be very happy. Thank you. Mark? OK, so the short answer is zero. I mean, when we when we start a research project, we, we, we target uh, the research results and so forth, and uh, we really don't really pay attention to dissemination. But there's another answer, thank God. Uh, we are lucky to be in some institution that have some uh, communication uh, service and, and these people uh, say uh <laughs> do what we should do probably which is to come and ask for our results and then try to to disseminate them into the general public so thanks to them uh, yes there is more than zero <laughs> but yes i have to confess the, the, the basic uh, concern of uh, Research uh, is closely true. There are exceptions. There are exceptions. Some people are really very good at this, but uh, mostly not at all. Evangelium? I think it's like also learning languages because the majority of the researchers, they can communicate very easily with their kind of uh, fellow researchers. So uh, scientific publication is not a problem. But they don't speak the language, you know, to explain things in simple terms to the general public. So it's something that I usually comment when I work with the projects is that, okay, where's your uh, public uh, communication to the general public? And they try to explain it and it's so complicated. And I really get the feeling that they too need some kind of skills development for researchers to communicate with the general public, to be able to explain in simple terms what they're doing. I mean, those videos, they were actually meant to be also shown to the general public, but I think not all of them work the way they should. So I think there is a lot of effort. We in the research projects that we are funding, we bring it more and more inside that you really have to have the end users on board. There is a pilot project now that will open in 22, actually it's opened. We uh, presented it also in the Info Day, where you have to have the citizens on board so in the design process. And we have the we had a topic that we called for last year in tackling bias and discrimination in AI, and that as well has to have the end users uh, on board. So I mean, this is something what we preach, but we would like to see more and more diversity, but also this kind of dialogue, the discourse with the general public. So researchers, scientists have to learn to speak that language. That's necessary indeed, yes. And um, sp also speaking of the images, I think we have sort of a rule at our institute is to avoid the human hand and the robot hand touching each other. <laughs> I think this should be forbidden. Uh, this is the new moral rule that Europe should have. And maybe I had a question for you, Dewey, because you might look at all the imagery being exposed to researchers we have in our research PowerPoints, uh, videos and all. A recurring images, of, uh, an artistic imagery that you might have maybe a thought on. Yeah, yeah I see. I, I mean, they all look the same for me. Like they, they have a, a color, imagery, etc. That kind of look the same. I have the same feeling. This is also my interest when creating robots, etc. That uh, there is a new aesthetism being developed, and and there is a huge impact on on when you communicate image but when you create robots also when you choose the color the volume you okay w most researchers probably don't have time and it's not the interest uh, to choose okay this color but there is a huge impact i think on the image it brings to the public on how we see it how we feel it etc i think this is something maybe we need to take attention i don't know where mm -hmm. what medium but 
And uh, Athena, also maybe, how do you, for instance, for your project, communicate about uh, about that to convince or to explain to others? Uh, is, are there rules that we should have in mind? Uh, for me, I, I'm trying to avoid anything uh, mathematical or uh, very uh, specific to the AI. I'm trying to explain the purpose and what is the goal and uh, try to be very uh, simple, um, uh, um, describe my work on a very simple set of steps on how to uh, solve the problem. Uh, so because I, I can understand that uh, people will not I know uh, what I'm talking about, and it w it is very complex for uh, uh, talking. Uh, I find this very complex <laughs> to, okay. to talk to uh, citizens with no uh, background. But I I'm trying to be as simple as I can be and uh, avoid um, details that are unnecessary for the person, so they can uh, just understand the problem and how to reach a solution. Okay. That's. Uh, Thank you. Are there any other questions? Yes, please. So just to let you know, we'll just take one last question from the public now. And afterwards, you can ask all the questions you want to all the speakers with here uh, during the cocktail with drinks. So um, I think that uh, one of the sources of confusion when talking to the general public uh, is the use of language about human activities referred to machines, algorithms, models, etc like learning, for example. So machine learning, learning is not the kind of learning that uh, we do when learning a new skill, a new topic, a new argument, something. Uh, do you agree? And uh, if yes, is, is, is it too late to change uh, the language that we use? Thanks. All right, Mark. Well, it's too late to change, uh, that's for <laughs> sure. <laughs> uh, yes, but I mean, you see also people in the street that, that talk to their car like if it, like, like it was a, a person or, or you know thing like that so I, I guess this is something that's done everywhere by everybody so probably it creates some confusion yes but then it becomes difficult to explain that machine learning is very different from human learning and it is I agree I mean uh, it's absolutely it doesn't they don't learn the same thing the same way but uh, in both in both cases, you you learn to recognize cats from dogs. So it's very diffi difficult to explain. You have to go into the detail that uh, you try to avoid. You know. So maybe Athena or Evangelia. Uh, Athena, any words on that? Well, I I cannot say anything about the language. Uh, I found it um, understandable, but I am on the research <laughs> side. So uh, I think that. Uh, the, the key is that um, use this uh, language, but uh, relate it. Uh, explain that uh, you use this language because you are trying to uh, mimic uh, a human. So uh, if you are learning uh, in machine learning, it means something very specific. It's not a, a general learning in uh, uh, as it is for humans, but. Uh, if a human was trying to do this specific thing as a uh, uh, machine learning model does, it will de do the same thing. So it is learning. So I, I would say that uh, the best way is to uh, try to convince the people that we use this language because we are trying to mimic uh, uh, an, an action of human. And uh, maybe I have a reverse question for you, Dewey, but how is it like to explain your work two people in AI, maybe who also have a different vocabulary, and that's also the starting point for most of the projects that we have, is we feel like we speak, we use uh, similar words, but a completely different understanding of vocabulary. So maybe, how did, how did that go for you? Um, I would say that it's easier because I, I have uh, something manual and I tend to avoid like, uh, uh, I think vocabulary, some, sometimes language is not the best uh, mean to, get to connection. Usually when I present my work, I try to, as you've probably seen, uh, to make people uh, touch, have a feeling, use other sense. And I think maybe also we need to not only use language as a mean of uh, explaining and communication, but also uh, showing, uh, touching, etc., experimenting, etc. Thank you. And I have a, yep, I think please. It's, it's 
I think you can change the language, but it's like with teachers. I mean, not all teachers will be able to explain in an easy terms and uh, for you to uh, embrace a specific subject. So it's specific soft skills that you need as well, I think, in order to explain things in easy terms. And sometimes I think that if you cannot explain it in easy terms, you're not you're not really knowing what you're talking about. So I think it's it's a talent, I think, to be able to be a storyteller, to explain something with in easy terms, with examples and everything. So everything's possible, but I think uh, it's the skill set of the person then probably. It's not all of them. It's like not all teachers. But I mean, some are better pedagogues than others. So I mean. uh, And uh, I think as a final maybe point also again for you, something that is fascinating to me is I think in Belgium, in research, Everybody come, a lot of people come from everywhere. So we are non-native English speakers for 99% of the part. Uh, we do work, live, uh, breathe in English for all the things related to AI. And I think that speaks to probably a lot of us where we came from different places, but then we still have to talk about something in a language that is not ours. And I think in the European Union context, it's even more important as things have to be translated, uh, words have to convey about the same meaning. And maybe I was curious, Evangelia or Mark, I saw you uh, uh, taking the mic. Maybe do you have any thoughts on that? Because uh, building a, a, a common vocabulary is sometimes a bit of a challenge when you have such a multicultural, multivocabulary language environment. Yes, uh, but now that the uh, UK has left uh, Europe, we could do it with English. Are you suggesting to go back to French? <laughs> that would be good for us. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Any thoughts on that? Or yeah. I, I'm, I, I I'm French. a visual yeah. person, so I like the visual. So I think you can explain a lot of things without necessarily using words. But I think uh, we have now machine translation systems that would allow us to communicate with everybody around the world. Maybe not with languages that are underrepresented, so this is something with, that we should aim for. But I think uh, it's possible to communicate. I can communicate with people if both sides want to really communicate and without even language. So even with science, I can communicate, I think. But it's the will there to communicate. I think that's essential in the beginning, okay. not necessarily the language. So visuals are important, and I hope you will help me in my fight against the generic images that I'll we try. see. All right, thank you. But thank you all. I think a big round of applause for the speakers. Thank you very much.